I want to start by just uh, saying again, as I did back in early January, how grateful I am to be here. It's really been uh, very enjoyable working with Shane and the staff, and he's done a great job uh, keeping and, and hiring support staff too, and those people are just so important as you work through a transition and, and the day-to-day. -day. Um, I really like what we're doing in the building and, and how we're doing it. Um, I feel like we're building things the right way and, and really trying to instill a great culture here. Um, that being said, it's going to require some time and patience and I tell our players about every second or third day that the culture we build will be reflected in how we play on special teams. And so our players, ultimately, when we get out there in September, will demonstrate their true commitment to the culture that we're building uh, by their effort, by their attention to detail, by their commitment to this phase of the game, because this is what requires putting the program first, putting their teammates first putting Carolina first. So um, those kind of big picture concepts um, are an important part of, of this initial phase um, as, as we try to work through things together. Um, we have a special team system. It's not the only system. I'm not saying it's the best system, but I do think it's a very comprehensive system and it's designed to make our players better fu fundamental football players, more knowledgeable football players in all three phases of the game. So I often show them clips of offense and defense in practice and how that correlates identically to the things that we're teaching them on special teams. Um, the focus has really been building the foundation, making sure that everybody in our meetings is speaking the same language, coaches, grad assistants, players, uh, our meetings are interactive. Uh, I'm often calling on our guys to see uh, if they can speak the language and regurgitate the things that, uh, that we're talking about conceptually um, and, and do it fast, right? Because uh, we're going to have to make full speed decisions on the field. Uh, on the practice field, it's been about competing, uh, finding out who can run, who can hit, um, trying to evaluate each and every guy on the roster and figuring out uh, where they will fit in because at the end of the day, it's like a big matrix and I have to be in complete uh, cohesion with uh, our offensive and defensive coordinators in terms of how they're utilizing our personnel and where all those guys fit in for us for special teams. But again, much appreciation to Shane because a day doesn't go by that he doesn't emphasize the importance of special teams and, and back me up in terms of expectations relative to starters on offense and defense playing on these units um, and so on. Um, I will say this, um, most special teams, uh, uh, the core of those guys uh, are often defensive backs and linebackers. And right now, uh, the facts are that we're just not very deep at those positions. Uh, and that's something that needs to, needs to grow as our roster grows, and it's not going to happen overnight. So we've been calling a lot of running backs and tight ends and wide receivers into duty on special teams and even on coverage units that are more often thought about for defensive players to be uh, involved uh, this spring, we've had to utilize a lot of those offensive guys. So we've been teaching them a lot of open field tackling, um, group tackling, where they have to work with other players in coverage and, uh, and, and trying to find out which one of those guys uh, can put their face on somebody and, and get a ball carrier to the ground because we're going to need some of those guys to do that. Um, some guys that have stood out. And, uh, you know, I watched all the film from last year, but, but that's not going to influence any decision making. It's good to know who has seen action, but when the new staff comes in, it's really a clean slate. Um, been so impressed with DK Joyner and his attention to detail and how coachable he is and um, how he grasps concepts, great practice habits. Uh, could really see him helping us on all four units. Nick Muse. Uh, has shown great leadership, great work ethic, really embracing special teams, uh, and a guy that we need to find some, some roles for. Sherrod Green, just a runner hitter, he's got really good feet, um, doing a nice job at linebacker, and, and a guy that we're going to be counting on 
Um, Brooks, Mangrum, I mentioned the receivers earlier, but those are guys uh, that show up every day. Peyton Mangrum's blocked a couple punts this spring and uh, seems to have a knack uh, for that. Tonka Hemingway, who's a D lineman, you know, a lot of times you don't think about those linemen, but uh, we do use a lot of big guys on the shield. Uh, so you need big O linemen and, and D linemen for those roles. And uh, Tonka's done a nice job there. Some other guys that I need to see more of uh, here before spring ball ends. Uh, Jay Brown has flashed a few times. Uh, Mo Cobb has flashed some. Jalen Dickerson's working his way back. Uh, onto the field right now, coming off an injury. So those could be some some guys that are contributors. Um, and then some guys that aren't here yet. <laughs> you know, some guys that we've signed that are coming in this summer, the Colby Fields of the world and the, the Bam Martin Scotts and, and uh, Caleb McDowell, who's shown promise as a returner. You know, we can talk about those guys now that they're signed and, and um, looking forward to getting those guys here this summer and getting them plugged in. So a lot of work to do. Um, you know, there's days where you, you feel like uh, Winston Churchill and you don't want to promise anything besides uh, blood, toil, swears, uh, tears and sweat or, or whatever I'm paraphrasing. But, uh, but we are making some progress. It is baby steps and, and I am thoroughly enjoying working with these guys. But um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot more good days of practice and, and a full summer and a full preseason to get us where we need to be. First question goes to David. Hey, Pete, Dave Kloniger with the Post and Courier newspaper in Charleston. Uh, good to see you again, and thanks for doing sure. this. You, you, you came into uh, a position where you had, you know, kind of established guys at kicker and punter with White and Kroger. So the question was, one, are those guys considered starters or is it open competition? And two, how comforting is it to know that if those guys are the guys that you've come in and like that position special teams are, are handled, ready to go? Yeah, great question. First of all, what I would say is, and I know Coach Beamer uh, feels the same way about this. It's a core value of our program, competition. And so we want to create competition every day. We want to give op guys opportunities to step up and perform under pressure. So we have been rotating our kickers, punters, snappers through in pressure situations throughout the spring. That being said, a guy like Parker um, does have a, a proven track record here, and he has been solid this spring. He's finishing up his master's degree, so we want to make sure he gets that done, which is awesome. Uh, but I'm really enjoying working with him. In general, with the specialists, I told them this on day one, and I remind them of this quite often. The good news is they're getting a lot more attention. The bad news is they're getting a lot more attention. And so um, they are adjusting to having a true position coach now who's coaching them through individual periods every day. We just did open field tackle out there today with the specialists for five minutes during practice. So we're trying to challenge them just like we're trying to challenge everybody else. And uh, I am pleased with the group. I, I would say we are a good group, um, but a group that can get a lot better and be a lot more consistent. Um, so creating that competition is helpful. Uh, Parker, I would say, continues to be a very accurate short to mid-range kicker for us right now, and we need to keep challenging him on some of the longer kicks. Uh, very happy with Kai Kroger as a holder. Uh, you know, coming from the University of Memphis, I had a guy named Preston Brady who won the Mortel Award as the best holder in the country, and he was phenomenal. Uh, Memphis is lucky to have him, and Kai Kroger can be that good as a holder. I'm very pleased with him. Uh, in that regard, from a punting standpoint, we're working on some things with him in terms of accuracy and hang time, operation time. Uh, he's a young guy, but he is a very hard worker and very committed to getting better. Mike Yuba. Hey, Pete. Uh, I know you mentioned two players in particular, uh, DeKaron Joyner and Nick Muse. You know, when, when you mention guys like that, um, or when you have guys like that, excuse me, that are stepping up on special teams, you know, you know, Muse obviously has aspirations of playing in the NFL. And then a guy like DK has pretty much done anything uh, that he's been asked to do these last couple of years. But when you have upperclassmen like that, how nice is that? And what can that do for a program, especially when you have younger guys, see guys like that step up on special teams? Yeah, it's so critical, Mike, in terms of building the culture, putting the program first, putting your teammates first, uh, understanding the importance of this. It's all part of a much bigger picture. 
um, that is, is going to be really the heart and soul of what we do. So that's always starts at the top. I always tried to be one of those head coaches that emphasized it every day and supported it every day. And it's great to be working for a guy like Shane who feels the same way. It's not just giving it lip service. And then those, those leaders, those guys that get it, and you mentioned two of them, um, they start leading by example first. All right? And then once they lead by example, they can become vocal leaders and influence some of the, the younger guys even more. But take uh, guys like Harris and, and guys on both sides of the ball, some of our DBs that are playing a lot of snaps. We need those guys to be role players on special teams as well if we want to maximize our potential as a football team. Dick Cox. Hi, Coach. Again, when you talked about Parker earlier, has Parker spent the spring, has he been able to increase any distance on his kicks? Is he working more towards accuracy? And my second question would be last year in the punt game, uh, there were a lot of games str really struggled to change the field, flip the field. Uh, have you been able to work on that this year on being able to flip the field in the punt game? Well, first, going back to Parker and really for all of the specialists, one of the things we did upon arriving and when Luke Day and his staff arrived, we decided, and I was 1,000% behind this, that our specialists were going to be in there lifting with everybody else on the team use, doing the same exact strength and conditioning program for nine weeks. And that's exactly what we did. They were in groups with O-linemen, D-linemen, linebackers. They were in the thick of things. And, and we try to do that in practice, too. They have roles in practice where they're around their teammates. And so that was all part of a mindset, but it was also to get them bigger and stronger. And so if you, if you ask Parker or ask Mitch Jeter, I think all of those guys will say they feel better about their bodies because they had a true offseason where the expectations of putting on weight um, and, and our nutrition staff does such a fabulous job in that regard and our strength and conditioning staff. So I think our whole group feels like they're bigger and stronger right now, and we're hoping that that translates to a few more yards on those field goals, a few more yards on those kickoffs, a few more yards on those punts. Now, the second part of changing the field position on punts, it's not just what the punter does, right? But it's making sure that we're doing a great job, not only in protection on punts, but covering punts. So we haven't done a ton of scheme work this spring, but one unit we have worked a lot of scheme is the punt unit um, because it's not just protection, but it's understanding those coverage concepts so that we can minimize the return game uh, for the opponent. Colin Taylor. For someone that maybe doesn't understand the ins and outs of special teams football the way you do, just how do you measure success from a special teams perspective and what does a good special teams unit look like? First of all, we take care of the football. So when you think about offense and defense, you think about turnovers and it's no different in special teams. We need to take care of the football. Uh, half the battle is not beating yourself. So every single day in spring practice, we dedicate time for our punt returners and our kick returners to be fielding balls. And even some of the upbacks that we'll use on kickoff return, those bigger guys that might have to field squib kicks and sky kicks, they get reps at that every day. Because first and foremost, it's about taking care of the football. The second thing is explosive plays. So you think about success on offense or defense. If your drive has an explosive play or two in it, you're more likely to score. Defensively, if you're giving up explosive plays, you're probably giving up points. So we need to find ways in terms of being competitive as an overall team to generate some of those explosive plays on special teams. However, we might do that in the return game, blocking punts. It might be some gadgets that we incorporate over the course of the season. Um, question before with field position. So the further away the opponent starts his drive, the less likely he is to score. The closer to midfield we start our drive, the more likely we are to score. So we measure field position. And then another factor is what we call hidden yards. There's all kinds of situations in a game that the statistics don't always reflect that will impact the outcome of the game. So a punt hits the ground and rolls 15 yards past the returner. We just lost 15 yards on that play where had we fielded that punt, 
we start 15 yards further ahead. Or there's a hold on a kickoff return that got out to the 30, and now that drive starts on the 15. We just lost 15 yards. So we track and measure that as well because we know at the end of the day, if we're on the plus side of that battle, we got a much better chance to win. And then the last thing is situations. There will be some things that come up over the course of a season that happen maybe once, maybe twice, that will win or lose a game on special teams. And if we are prepared for those situations, if we, if we know how to handle ourselves in those situations, we'll come out on the good end of those things. If we don't, then we're not going to look very good after the game in the press conference and on Sunday. So we've already started to invest some time talking about how we handle those situations. Hill. Coach, it may not necessarily be something that, that you guys have to worry about in the short term, but what, what's y'all's philosophy when it comes to evaluating kickers and punters for scholarships and, and recruiting and how we guys kind of go about uh, evaluating and making those decisions down the road? Sure. Well, you're obviously going to have a very limited number of those guys on scholarship. So, you know, going back to, to uh, my head coach days, you always had a master plan that had a little bit of flexibility built into it, but you had numbers for each position based on what your philosophy was on each side of the ball. If you're a four down defense, so many defense, interior defensive linemen, so many edge players, so many linebackers. If you were a three down team, you might be configured differently. Same thing on offense based on uh, are you a 10 personnel team, you need more wideouts. You're a heavy tight end offense. You're going to be a little bit heavier at that position. But the specialist number is always relatively low. So you're usually going to have a combination of scholarship guys and preferred walk-on type guys in your program. And I came from Division Three football. I coached non-scholarship football for many years. So I look at everybody the same way. We're one football team. Uh, when we go to the meeting room, when we go out on the field, it doesn't matter where you came from. It, it, it matters, you know, how you're performing and, and are we putting you in position to be successful. So that being said, um, with your specialists, you're always cultivating guys. You're always hoping that maybe one of those preferred walk-ons ends up being a scholarship player because you know what you have. Uh, and I've recruited – uh, specialist. In fact, we signed one at Memphis last year out of high school and went through a very thorough year-long process before we made that decision. And it felt really good when we ended up extending that offer. But there's always risks involved when you take a specialist straight out of high school versus having somebody in your program that you've seen grown and develop and you know who's going to show up every day. Um, so I think it's really important that, uh, that you're cultivating and developing all your guys and, and it's very important in the specialist group. John Del Bianco. Hey, Coach, who's getting reps at kick returner and punt returner this spring, and how many live reps have they been able to get, whether it's through practice or the scrimmage this past Saturday and what you have planned this Saturday? Sure. Well, I'll answer the second part of your question first. We're, we're not uh, giving those guys live reps in the spring. Uh, they are getting thudded up in various special teams drills and in offense and defensive drills. So I do get a chance to see those guys with the ball in their hand. Are they trustworthy ball security guys? We're not going to put somebody back there that, that we don't trust to catch it and then have great ball security uh, after the catch. Um, Brooks, Joyner, uh, Josh Van, those guys jump out. Uh, as guys that have been very solid and steady kick returners for us so far this spring. And over on the, the, the punt return side, Marion Brown has been a nice addition there. Uh, Rico Powers has been very steady. And I'll mention Josh Van again because he's been, we've been repping him at both kick returner and punt returner, um, pleased with his ball skills and, and pleased with his understanding of the differences and the nuances uh, of catching kicks versus catching punts. Uh, Coach Hardesty and Coach Stepp have been uh, a big help to me because we're all about maximizing reps and maximizing efficiency in those special teams periods. So I can't be six places at once. So you have to have great assistant coaches that are on board, buying into special teams as well. Uh, Coach Stepp and Coach Hardesty really take pride in coaching those returners. Uh, I'm very grateful for their help. Greg Hadley.
Hey, Coach. It's Greg Hadley with the State Newspaper. Uh, I was just curious, uh, is Zaquandre White getting a lot of work with you guys? Because uh, he was a player that, you know, got a, got a lot of special teams work last season, and Coach Hardesty mentioned him as, you know, having some impact there as well. No question. He's been one of our really solid overall guys, competes in practice, love his effort, love his attitude. Uh, we have gotten him some reps at kick returner as well. Um, but the thing I love about Z is he's very coachable. Um, he takes pride in what he does. If he makes a mistake, he owns it. Um, and that's a guy that we could really use on three or four units, still trying to evaluate where he can help us the most. But he's, he's a guy that can run. He's a guy that's willing to put his face on people. Um, he's a guy that, uh, that blocks very well. And there's great carryover to what we're teaching him on return units and the same things that Coach Hardesty is teaching those guys in pass protection. So that's the thing when they go into a kick return drill. We want those running backs to understand that they're getting more reps in pass protection. Uh, it all fits together um, like a big jigsaw puzzle. Josh Kendall. Hey, Pete. How you doing? Good, Josh. Um, a big picture question, and I'm going to narrow it down into a smaller topic. Does college football value punt returners enough? And is that a position that you could, as a former head coach, or now to convince your current head coach, we need to give that guy a scholarship only because he's got it returning punts. And if he never does anything else for four years, he's worth it. My, my first boss uh, was a guy named Bob Ford, who's now retired. He was kind of the Bobby Bowden of Division Three coaches. I was fortunate to, to, to start up my career off for him. And he used to say, you don't miss organization unless you don't have it. And I would say the same thing with a punt returner, right? You, you don't miss that unless you don't have a guy that you trust back there, right? And, and a guy that you're worried every time he's going to go back there that the ball might end up on the ground. So there's definitely value in having a reliable, solid, steady guy back there. Uh, the year I was at Rice, we ended up using a tight end H back back there by the end of the year just because he was the most trustworthy guy. Now, ideally with your returners, you are recruiting combination guys. So when we evaluate somebody right now who's a receiver, a running back, a defensive back, um, if we see that they have reps on film as a punt returner or as a kick returner, that, that raises their stock right there because we know that they can add value to our program um, and not just solely be uh, a punt returner per se. Um, you know, you've got to be somewhat careful how many real small guys you have on your roster because there's going to be a limited amount of roles for those guys. Slot receiver, um, you know, maybe a tailback that, that you can get away with a smaller guy, but there's going to be a limited amount of roles that that guy can play and on special teams as well. So ideally, you'd love to have somebody who is primarily um, a, a, at another position, a corner, a receiver, a running back, but somebody that has demonstrated as a high school player that they can do that. Anecdotally, it seems to me that the NFL has has – gone that direction we've seen got them reach for guys division three whoever they may be whatever their size may be with the speed simply for that position am i making up that trend or is that something that you think you've seen too well i, I don't claim to be an expert on nfl rosters in fact i would defer to my son aj who uh, uh has been following that stuff closely since he was about seven i usually go to him for my nfl information but uh, i would think on a 53-man roster that unless you are the tailback or you are the receiver or, or the corner, uh, the rest of those guys better be playing on three or four units. So it's all about adding value. And, and the more things that you can do, the more things you can demonstrate competency at, uh, the better your chances are. And obviously you, you come to a place like this and there are guys in the room every day that have aspirations of playing in the NFL. I don't like to talk about that every day because I think it's more about investing in what we're doing now. But uh, we, do, we do show NFL clips, and, and we do refer to that from time to time because if you do hope to make one of those rosters someday, you're certainly going to add an awful lot of value to yourself if you can do some other things on those special teams units. Thank you. Yes, sir. Colin Taylor. You were one of 
Shane's first hires um, in this process, and you've gotten to see him kind of build this 2021 recruiting class from from when he got here to now. Where where are you guys in recruiting, and how has that gone for you, not only for the class you've been able to build, but for 22 and 23 onward? I'm so glad you asked me that question um, because it, it gives me a chance to say a couple things. First, uh, I have been so impressed with how hard Shane has been working at recruiting himself. He is on it. He knows about the guys on our boards. Um, he is in constant contact with uh, many, many, many of the guys that we are recruiting at all positions and building a relationship with those guys. It's been so impressive to see how hard he is personally working at recruiting every day. And to do that, he's had to trust the three coordinators to really uh, manage our phases of the game. Um, and, and he's in our offices every day and giving us feedback. Um, but he's really done a great job of being on top of the recruiting and also doing some of the external things that a head coach has to do when you're trying to build a program. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, and then the second part is, um, I have been working really hard at it myself, and I say that not trying to toot my own horn whatsoever, but um, I take a lot of pride in, in trying to contribute and not taking a back seat, and I have a, the, the competitive juices in me too. So if I'm assigned an area to recruit, I'm going to try to be very thorough and very organized and bring guys to the table for the offensive and the defensive coaches to look at. It's not just about recruiting some specialists every other year or something like that. It's about getting into areas that we want to try to find the best and the brightest and trying to get those guys excited about what we're doing here in Columbia and to get those guys in front of our coaches. And so uh, I'm very excited to be back on the East Coast, back in some areas, uh, whether they be in South Carolina, in North Carolina, and certainly Northern Virginia on up into New England uh, that I'm very familiar with and have a lot of strong ties with high school coaches and, and know those programs and trying to bring some of those guys to the table. And I appreciate our assistant coaches being receptive to that and, and looking at a good player is a good player. It doesn't matter where he's from. Uh, if he's a guy that can, can help improve our roster, we should be taking a look at him. Hale. Coach, sticking to that subject, uh, the, the New England portion of the country where, where South Carolina doesn't really recruit a lot or traditionally hasn't done a, a whole lot up there. What, what, what do you feel like it, uh, the, the university offers to, to guys from that area and what's sort of your pitch to guys when you're trying to convince them to, uh, to come all the way down here and, and take a look? Absolutely. And, and let me say this. We're not going to be spending a, as much time in, in Massachusetts as we would in Maryland. Uh, obviously, the closer we get, uh, the easier it gets to, to attract those guys. And, and in some cases, there are more of them in the Carolinas and in Georgia and in Florida and, and into Virginia and Maryland and so forth. But um, I will say a, a couple things. One is uh, we are the northernmost SEC school here on the East Coast. And so for those guys from the D.C. area or Philly or New Jersey or, or central Pennsylvania, wherever it may be, uh, it's a pretty easy drive to get down here. Many of those guys have come to South Carolina on vacation. They've, they've, they've been to Charleston. They've been to the beaches. So they have, they have uh, grandparents that might live down this way. So um, coming to South Carolina is something that's very familiar to them. Driving down Interstate 95 or Interstate 81 to 77, that's familiar to them. Uh, they're, they're intrigued. Um, maybe their school hasn't heard from South Carolina before, and, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're trying to, to get involved in those, in those areas, and it's, in, it's intriguing. Uh, the other thing is that about 25% of our student body comes from those areas right now. And so uh, those, those student athletes that we're potentially recruiting, um, our university is familiar to them because other students from their high school have applied here and in some cases come to school here. I'll give you one example. Uh, two families, uh, both Georgetown grads that, that my wife and I went to school with, and both have 
children here. Those kids could have went anywhere in the country. Their, their parents are a lot smarter than me, um, and, and they could have sent them a lot of different places, but they're, they're both here and having fantastic experiences at the University of South Carolina. So uh, when we go into a high school in Northern Virginia or we go into a high school um, in South Jersey, uh, when we get a chance to go out and start doing those things again, uh, there is going to be some familiarity with our institution.